The modern discussion of the engines of the future is often focused on increasing the power of fuel makeup or increasing the efficiency of ion thrusters, as these two technologies are not only used often in spaceflight but have room for massive improvements. Metallic hydrogen is currently seen as the best liquid fuel rockets could use, but is only produced in extreme conditions such as the centers of gas giants. Ion thrusters are incredibly efficient with their fuel, but take large amounts of power to run, as well as only being able to produce a tiny amount of thrust, useful for deep space maneuvers but not for getting off of a planet. But what about the engines of the far future? What could our rockets look like set thousands of years into the future once we have improved nearly everything we can about how we get into space? What possibilities exist under current known science, and what could be theoretical under unknown science? Welcome back to Serious Science, and these are what our many times over great-grandchildren could be using to conquer the universe in the far future. To begin, I will introduce several powerful engine designs that are currently on the drawing board for both interplanetary and interstellar travel. But for all of the designs I will be talking about, they will need to do two things. Be efficient with their fuels and keep the crew alive while they are firing. An extremely powerful rocket that can accelerate at more than 100 Gs per second is useful for getting to distant places quickly, but would turn anything not made of steel into a fine paste, just as an engine that fired some kind of efficient nuclear fuel could irradiate the crew aboard if they were not heavily insulated against their own ship. So what kind of engines do we have planned for conquering the task of flying to another star? Let's begin with one that was surprisingly designed for a planned mission to Alpha Centauri near the end of the Apollo program. That's right, we had already begun designing interstellar ships with a serious plan to reach other stars as soon as we had landed on the moon. Of course, the exploration killer called Insufficient Funding had murdered not only this idea in its infancy, but caused a 50-year gap in manned missions landing on other worlds. So, what did the engineers of the 70s have in mind? Well, at the time, the power of the atom was beginning to see more use in things other than bombs, being considered for use in long-lasting and powerful reactors that could provide steady power outputs to ships needing energy for hundreds and even thousands of years. But this didn't stop the mad lads from considering their explosive potential as well. Introducing the Orion Drive, something many of you may already be familiar with, so I will keep the explanation short. Basically, instead of putting a motor nozzle on the back of a ship, you could instead move a massive metal plate onto the rear and cut a hole in its center just wide enough for an atomic bomb to pass through. These bombs would explode just behind this metal plate, which would be mounted using gigantic shock-absorbing springs that would take the force of the atomic explosion and gently turn it into a steady thrust force instead of one sudden jolt of forwards motion. Thousands of these bombs would explode behind the craft, accelerating it to interstellar speeds over the course of several months. Now, the observant among us may think to themselves, hey Andy, wouldn't a constant stream of atomic blasts right next to a spaceship be, you know, a bad thing? And to that, I would say, yes. But only if that giant insulating plate wasn't there. The plate would not only need to be strong enough to survive an ungodly amount of explosions caused by our most powerful and destructive weapons, but would also need to stop all of the radiation they produce from reaching the internals of the craft and poisoning the crew. We actually have materials that can accomplish both, with similar yield atomic weapons, as if we used SAR bombs, the most powerful bomb ever built that actually had its power halved during construction due to the thought that its full explosive yield would be overkill. Yeah, really. These forces would be impossible to safely absorb with any kind of shock absorbing system we can construct. So, we can find a middle ground between power and safety, while also reducing the size of these bombs in order to store even more. But this design has a massive hurdle we will need to overcome in order to build it, lifting that giant multi-ton metal plate into space in the first place. The Orion Drive is not able to lift a ship or itself into space, and even if it was, I doubt anyone would want a couple hundred bombs going off on or above their delicate launch platforms. This would necessitate the construction of such rockets in orbit around Earth, launching the metal plate and other parts with multiple rockets, and assembling everything in the weightlessness of orbit. As a matter of fact, most of the systems I will be talking about will need to be built in space, as their engines would decimate anything it was pointed towards on the surface. But this shouldn't be an issue for humanity a couple thousand years into the future that has spread out to every corner of our solar system. 
Such a race of interplanetary travelers would have immense power over the resources of their worlds and could construct machines of truly incomprehensible ability, which leads us to considering engines of a more contemporary design, such as those that would use fuels that are still impossible to attain. While metallic hydrogen would be the most efficient liquid fuel we could use in rockets, we will look to fuels that outperform liquid systems, as we want our fuel to weigh as less as possible while still having immense levels of potential energy. So how about those antimatter engines everyone keeps talking about? Antimatter is the ultimate fuel we could combust, as it turns all of its mass into energy. This is what's known as the efficiency of a fuel, and is dependent on how much energy we can get out of a material. Most of the matter we use for storing and releasing energy is often unused in the process of combustion. The best rocket fuels we currently use only use about 60 to 70 percent of the fuel in the actual combustion process, as the rest is passed through the nozzle without igniting. Antimatter is a perfect 100% conversion of mass to energy, as if an antimatter particle comes into contact with a regular one, they will both be instantly turned into energy. Antimatter also attracts regular matter to itself, heightening its efficiency. But we do not want this process to occur instantly, as if all of the fuel was used up at once, we would have just created a machine known as a bomb. The speed of these processes will need to be controlled, as even the rocket engines we have today are just a balancing act of letting just enough fuel turn itself into an explosion without growing large enough to explode the rest of the rocket. We can theoretically control the amount of antimatter and matter combining in the engine nozzle using regulatory magnetic fields, as antimatter reacts with magnetism and can be restrained using these fields. Antimatter isn't some entirely theoretical energy source, as we have detected these particles around the orbits of gas giants, as well as creating this stuff using particle accelerators. However, the direct generation of antimatter in accelerators only produces about one billionth of a gram of antimatter per year of constant activation, all of which immediately annihilates itself against the stream of regular matter that the accelerator is filled with. So yeah, not a good source of potential fuel. This isn't to say that we won't get any better at farming and containing antimatter in the future, and more knowledge on how this material functions will be needed to make any improvements to systems that use it as fuel. Just as you can improve the amount of science in your life by subscribing. See, I'm getting better at these integrations. I post once a month and won't fill your sub box with videos. Moving on. But what about fusion? The power source that always seems so close to being a reality, yet so far away. Why is that? We've spent many decades working to solve the fusion problem, and have made massive improvements to other technology since then. After all, it only took 66 years from the first powered airplane flight to us setting foot on the moon. Surely fusion should be in the homes of everyone by now, right? Well, we hit a massive problem when engineering fusion, one that isn't solved by discovering better technologies. The main problem with fusion is what we make our reactors out of. Fusion mainly occurs in the cores of stars, and is what creates all the light and heat associated with those stars. But even these engines of creation are not enough for what we would need from fusion. It takes many tons of stellar matter to produce even a single watt of fusion power. We need to do better than stars. We have materials that can survive temperatures equal to that at the center of our sun, but they cannot survive this onslaught for long, often being scrapped after their uses, which only lasted for less than a second. How can we create a metal that can not only survive temperatures far harder than those at the cores of stars, extreme magnetic fields, and unbelievable amounts of damaging radiation that would need to sustain this damage for hours and even hundreds of years of continuous use, such as what we would need on board interstellar ships? This is what separates us from unlimited power. If fusion was unlocked, fossil fuels, solar power, and even nuclear energy would become laughably weak compared to a literal man-made hyperstar. The fuel that would be needed for fusion reactions is also the most common element in the universe, hydrogen. But don't we have some fusion reactors that have managed to put out more energy than they needed to start the reaction? Yes, but the output is still barely enough to run a light bulb from, and requires a heavy investment of energy to begin this tiny reaction. But all of the designs we currently have use powerful magnetic fields to constrain the superheated plasma, keeping it from touching the matter the reactor is made of, as it would melt anything we threw against it. Fusion energy would be the second best power source we could make, with antimatter being the most power we can get from a fuel. But fusion would be the safest and most adaptable source we can currently imagine, as the reaction can be shut down fairly quickly without releasing anything more dangerous than reduced heat. 
Another theoretical method of generating massive amounts of both power and thrust are black hole drives. We still know very little about black holes other than what the math behind them says may be possible, and we have no idea how to make one ourselves. But black holes can make literal magic happen when it comes to the wavelengths of light. As light travels past a black hole, some of that light will be swallowed, but most of it will not only bend around the black hole, but the effects of bent spacetime will actually intensify these waves. The peak of these waves will heighten and may even shorten the distances between one another, turning radio into ultraviolet. What does this mean for energy purposes? Well, if we could find or create a black hole that was small enough to encase in a structure, we could fire high intensity frequencies of light towards the edge of its event horizon, while coating the interior of the structure in reflective panels. These wavelengths would strengthen and intensify as it bounced from mirror to event horizon over and over again, until we could open a panel and harvest the now incredibly powerful rays for use in generating electricity. We may even let these rays grow to the point of supercriticality, opening a panel and releasing them as pure thrust. This effect that black hole infers onto passing wavelengths is called super radiant scattering, and I'm sure many of you have already watched the Kurzgesagt video on the topic that describes just how devastating not opening a panel in time would be for anything surrounding that black hole. But we can do better, much better. In the distant future, these methods of generating massive amounts of power to move yourself around the universe may seem passé compared to moving those destinations to yourself. The most successful video on this channel has been about the realistic creation of faster-than-light engines, and I'm not surprised. Why would you spend all of your time and resources creating a slightly better rocket when you could break the universe and travel faster than reality itself? If you'd like more on how we could feasibly travel faster than light, I would recommend watching that video. But today I'd like to talk about another engine engine that could do even better than a faster than light craft could ever hope to do, instantaneous travel through wormhole drives. Wormholes are one of the most common and also most misunderstood subjects in science fiction, able to take you forwards and backwards in time, or to another universe, or even outside of the universe. But wormholes, as they are currently theorized, operate entirely within the laws of creation. Simply put, space-time, the physical fabric that we all rest on that gives matter and particles their properties through them interacting within space-time, can warp and bend and operate differently depending on where you are and what you're standing next to. Gravity can slow and accelerate time, while also rippling and bending space-time. Gravity can change the shape of not only what rests on space-time, but the fabric of reality and all of its laws. Why send a ship out to a distant star when you could bend the space between you and that star so that you could walk forwards a single step and have traveled the equivalents of a few trillion miles? How would we make these wormholes, and what disasters could opening one create? Well, as of right now, the only wormholes that exist are on drawing boards and in discussions of theoretical physics. But to be fair, we've only proven without a doubt that black holes existed three years ago, and they were widely accepted to exist long before that, as our understanding of physics had predicted them far before we photographed one for ourselves. But wormholes are special in one aspect that we do not expect to see occurring naturally anywhere in the universe. They contain event horizons like black holes do, but these horizons are split and stretched in a gravitational method that we still do not understand. For a wormhole to accomplish what we would need them to do, that being folding two points of space together into a single point, we will need to do several things. One is to supply a constant pressure keeping that wormhole open, a pressure that will need to be strong enough to tear a black hole apart, an object with literal infinite density. This is because our wormhole ends will desperately be trying to snap closed as they will be a temporary powerful anomaly to how the fabric of reality normally operates. Folding and bending the fabric of space-time will require a truly unfathomable amount of gravitational force, as gravity is one of the most well-known forces that can change the shape of reality. Something will be needed to keep this immense gravitational collapsing force at bay long enough to send anything through, a force that is still entirely theoretical. I talked about negative mass matter, or exotic matter, back in my Faster Than Light video, but I will recap here as the science behind exotic matter is quite interesting. In short, along the surface of space-time, in spaces so small they would be as small to an atom as that atom would be to our entire planet, particles pop in and out of existence through an unknown mechanism. These particles are more often than not created in pairs, mostly antithetical to each other, meaning that they will almost always snap together instantly and annihilate one another. But sometimes larger particles are created, and it is theorized that a sort of anti-graviton could be produced in the quantum foam, 
or in simpler terms, a particle with anti-gravitational properties. If we were able to collect these particles before they were destroyed by their regular matter pairs, we would have a powerful source of anti-gravity that may be able to hold back the forces of a black hole, exactly what we would need to keep wormholes open. But if it turns out that we can in fact generate these wormholes, we may have another problem on our hands. As we understand it now, we cannot choose a location for our wormholes to exit into, and may be relegated to creating entry and exit portals back here on Earth. The ends of these portals could be transported to distant places in the universe, while the opening would be orbiting Earth for transport use. If certain theories about quantum wormholes being created at the beginning of the universe are true, then we may be able to tap into already existing wormholes that had their ends stretched faster than they could close when the universe first experienced rapid expansion. These primordial wormholes would take us to random places, and may be unable to have those destinations shifted by our efforts, but may open up a vast hub of possible destinations all across the universe, measuring billions of light years away from their origins. Messing around with the fabric of reality sounds like a good idea when the benefits are instantaneous travel across impossible distances, but it may rear back to bite us if we push it too far. One of the concerns with wormholes are time paradoxes, as you would be traveling faster than light, gravity, and the informational constant, meaning you could influence events before they could affect you, opening up a Pandora's box of dangerous and possibly civilization-erasing paradoxes. Of course, everything regarding wormholes is still entirely theoretical, including how they could backfire, and with more knowledge we may realize that these methods of travel are more or less dangerous than we had previously thought. We may activate one around Earth that immediately explodes with the carnage of a thousand ships that would have entered it during its expected lifetime, all colliding at the same instant of Earth relative time. Or we could open one up into an unknown brain of existence that all wormholes pass through during their lifespan that immediately releases stellar amounts of radiation, or begin growing in mass rebounding from everything close to its stretched path of travel. We have no idea as of today what opening one could entail, but the prize of instant travel seems too good to at least not try for. Perhaps the forces needed to both open and keep open a wormhole decimates any civilization that attempts it, and wormhole travel is seen as the final filter for intelligence, at least to those who have done so in the instant that they realize they have destroyed themselves. As of now, we have no idea what will be needed to open such wormholes, but the universe has left us breadcrumbs leading to different possibilities of breaking the light speed barrier within how physics operates, something we have nailed down fairly confidently. One day, when we know more about how to expand quantum processes to the macroscopic world, we may be able to enjoy even more far-fetched methods of travel, methods still undreamt of by us. Only time and exploration will tell, and the environments of the far future may be home to engines staunchly believed to be impossible by our current theories. I hope you all enjoyed, and thank you very much for watching. But before you go, I implore you to visit the community tab of this channel as I post regular polls on topics for future videos that you can vote on, as well as some facts that I find interesting about the universe that wouldn't make for good videos. Thank you all again so very much.